Let's get started. So um, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker today, um, Curry Maypay. May, May Curry. So um, Curry currently acts as an advisor, threat intelligence and detection for Ali Lilly and company. In this role, he's responsible for developing and uh, maturing Lilly's information security cyber threat intelligence program and driving the creation of better threat detection capabilities. Prior to joining Lilly, Carr reserved 12 years in the Army as an all source threat analyst, where he performed a variety of intelligence functions, including collection management, threat intelligence analysis and operational assignments to support operations aboard. Corey has specialties in threat entity targeting, open source intelligence collection, and intelligence support to counter terrorism, weapons of mass destruction, geopolitical tensions, and the cyber-based threats. Without, uh, without further ado, let's welcome Corey. <laughs> Hello everyone. Um, thanks for having me today. So I, I kind of look forward to kind of providing you guys the perspective on uh, from cybersecurity that I've kind of grown up and maturing in over the last 13 or 14 years, um, and potentially to get you guys to look at you know cybersecurity, uh, potential information security as especially that you might potentially be interested in, and illustrate some of the ways in which that we proactively try to protect. Um, our endpoints, our network, Lily's most critical assets um, from those adversaries, from those bad guys, from those attackers um, that would like to do Lily harm um, or, you know, like to steal what potentially Lily is developing as far as the next life-saving drug. Um, so, um, as overall, that was a great introduction. Um, so I, I, I do, I, I lead Lily's threat intelligence team. Um, so I lead Lily's implementation of or identification of things which might propose a cyber-based threat to Lily. And I'll kind of cover exactly what that means um, in upcoming slides as far as what is a cyber-based threat. Um, and additionally, my team is responsible for identification of those things which pose a threat to Lily from a cyber standpoint. And then how do we implement some type of some type of uh, effort or some type of me um, mechanism in order to mitigate the risk or those threats from being realized at Lilly. Um, so as everyone here has probably read about or potentially been experience, experience um, the myriad of various different cyber threats um, that you might have, I don't know, your favorite uh, websites, your favorite companies or companies that you um, have entrusted your data to. Um, my job, my team's responsibility is for proactive identification of those threats and then trying to implement or identify measures in order to hopefully knock on wood, prevent Lily from, you know, being on being in the news. Uh, day, it's a daily concern of mine of how we make sure we protect Lily's most critical assets and ensure we can continue to make life-saving medicine. Um, and as, as was already covered, I, I, I came to this role probably three years ago um, after I left the military, uh, where I was an officer of threat intelligence analyst, focused on a, a few different subjects from counterterrorism and weapons of mass destruction. Um, so I, what I want to draw your attention to first is the quote from Sun Tzu. Um, so this is kind of the basis of what I do, my team does. Um, so if, if you're not familiar with this quote from the art of war, it's working to understand if you, if you know your enemy and you know yourself, you should not fear any uh, battle. Um, so what that means to me and my team is as long as we know ourselves, know our most critical assets, know um, how adversaries or individuals or cyber criminals would like to target us, um, what are the opportunities for those adversaries to target us? And then work to specifically understand how they might target us, what are their capabilities. Um, we can proactively work to prevent those 
adversaries from realizing their intentions. Um, so this quote and the next quote I'm going to cover uh, is going to come up a few times um, as the basis of pretty much threat intelligence. Um, and I, you know, I'll cover what threat intelligence is. So how organizations use threat intelligence in order to tailor an approach in order to prevent cyber criminals from deploying ransom malware, um, breaking into email, and various other things. So um, it's, again, know yourself, know your enemy, know how they operate. One of the other quotes um, that comes into play and sets the groundwork for some of the things that I'm going to cover is a quote from Donald Rumsfeld. Um, and the first time that I kind of heard this quote, it absolutely made no sense to me. Um, but as I've grown up in threat intelligence, um, it, it started to make sense. Um, and again, sorry, and I didn't cover this, but along the way, if anyone has any questions at all, please feel free to chime in or if you want some additional context. Um, I'm okay. It seems like a relatively smaller class, so if we want to make this a little bit uh, more of a back and forth, 100% open to that. Um, so the specific quote from Donald Rumsfeld is, um, there are known knowns, these are the things that we know that we, uh, we know. Uh, there are known unknowns that say that, we, that there are things that we know that we don't know, and then there are also known unknowns. There are, say, they, these are things that we don't know that we don't know. So um, it 100% sounds like gibberish. Um, and I don't know if there's a, someone on the call that wants to chime in and say what it potentially means to them. Anyone brave enough to kind of chime in? No one. Okay. Um, so from from where my team operates is from a threat intelligence standpoint, um, there are unknown unknowns. Uh, so there, are, these are things that clearly we don't know how the adversary. Uh, there are known knowns. Sorry, starting at the top, there are known knowns. We know how potentially an adversary or someone might target us. Um, then there are known unknowns. So we might know an adversary has some type of intent to target us, but we might not know exactly how they might target us. And then there are unknown unknowns. So this is the space where we don't even know potentially. If someone wants to target us, how they might target us. So in the space of threat intelligence, uh, my team works to identify the ways in which an organ to so take those unknowns, we not knowing absolutely anything, not knowing how an entity might want to target us or that they potentially want to target us, and translating this into the potentially an understanding of who might want to target us and then shifting this from um, just knowing how th that they want to target us to exactly how they would target us. So this goes from not knowing it. So my team works to operate and function in the space of, um, at this point, we don't know anyone wants to target us, um, but we want to collect information from our various different sources to translate that into an understanding of who they are uh, what their motivation is, what their capabilities are, um, and then translating this overall into some type of action um, that we can take. So said simply, uh, we want to take the myriad of them. So in, in, was there any questions? Yeah, um, yeah, Corey, um, a really quick question. I wonder if um, um, unknown knowing would, would make sense here. Because you mentioned like no one, no one, no one, unknown, 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 and there's one missing, which is unknown knowns. I wonder if uh, it 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 makes sense in a way. So it uh so that would be potentially something that we don't know. We know, yeah. Oh, like no. something like we we do not know we have the knowledge already. Um, hmm. So I, it's, it's just a a random question. I'm not sure if it it makes sense here. Um, I can think of like something, let's say like we have some some data somewhere, but we just forgot it or I don't oh, know. That's, uh, uh, and, that, and that kind of gets into the larger scale issue that we also run to run into, say, from organizations like Lily. Lily has 50,000, more than probably 50,000 users. 
large amounts and terabytes and terabytes of data that we process on, on a daily basis. So to your point, 100 percent, there there is data that could get lost. We could potentially not know that we know something um, just because we potentially have no mechanism in which to parse and process the large amounts of data um, that we are we, that we deal with. Um, and there are mechanisms that are kind of maturing from, say, machine learning and AI, which is hoping to bridge this gap. But that, no, that's a perfect call out that there, there we could potentially forget that we know something or um, not know that we know something just because we're incapable or have no ability to process the data that we, which we have. Gotcha. Thank you. So if we want to simplify that, where my team operates in is in these four different buckets, uh, protect, detect, respond, and improve. Um, so what my team does is first and foremost, try to identify the measures in which that we need to implement in order to protect uh, my organization's most critical data. Um, so what are the preventative protective controls that we can implement? So say AV, um, your antivirus solutions, uh, making sure that we have multi-factor authentication um, on systems, which would prevent someone from logging, uh, logging in or stealing someone's account. Um, how do we make sure that those, step, implement, those measures that we are implementing actually address a threat that we're faced with? And then from a detection standpoint, what are the things, the highest profile threats or that we need to ensure that we can detect. So if, for instance, loss of Lily's uh, most critical uh, intellectual property is a concern, how do we detect that? So what logs, what type of query language do we need to implement in order to ensure that in the event of someone trying to maybe move terabytes and terabytes of data, say in the case of what happened to Equifax, how do we detect that as that is ongoing and how do we detect that before they actually realize, before they actually achieve their objective? Um, so in the case of Equifax, if for anyone who's not familiar, I'm pretty sure most are, um, threat actors broke into um, the Equifax environment um, using vulnerabilities um, in a platform known as Apache Struts. Uh, and then the adversary lived in or operate inside of their environment for uh, multiple weeks. And then along this time, they began to exfiltrate hundreds of thousands of data belonging to you and me, belong of uh, you know, social security numbers, credit card numbers, um, et cetera. So how do we detect that behavior in our environment in, 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 in a timely manner before that adversary is able to achieve their objective? And then respond. So how do we respond? If we do get some type of indication of a bad guy living, a bad person living in our environment, um, that we can respond to it, prevent, clear them from our environment, um, and uh, make sure that they don't regain access and then improve. How do we make sure that the security tools, the technology that we are, we are purchasing, um, and for some, if you, if you don't realize, uh, securing a corporation like Lilly is a pretty hefty, uh, comes at a pretty hefty cost. How do we make sure that the assets, the technology that we're buying actually addresses some type of threat um, that we could potentially be faced with? So this, these are the four key spectrums that my team operates in, trying to prevent and protect a cyber threat from occurring, trying to detect it if those adversaries do gain access to our environment, make sure that we can, pro, we can officially respond to it and uh, limit the impact, and then over time, how do we take lessons learned from the um, potential cyber attack? Uh, and then, oh, again, along the way, if anyone has any questions, we'll have Q&A at the end, but if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, so first and foremost, I think um, it's kind of important first to kind of dissect and understand what do we consider a cyber threat. 
Um, so, you know, if you hear cyber, if you hear threats, every threat is not equal. Um, everything that, say, my organization potentially cares about may not be pertinent to, um, say, an organization like Purdue. So, for instance, um, in order to the, the adversaries that might want to target, say, those I mean, those, a, a, a organization like Purdue might not have the either capability or interest in targeting a organization like Lilly. So when we think of what is a cyber threat, we look to con consider a cyber threat as having three different components, and these three different components having to have some type of overlap. So starting off with hostile intent. So there, that adversary, that entity behind that cyber-based threat must have some type of motivation, some type of interest, desire to target either the information, the assets, um, whatever it may be that you possess. Um, if they don't have hostile intent against your organization or, or, or sectors in which you operate, is it really a threat that you should potentially care about? Um, and then they must have a proven capability. So they must have some type of knowledge, resource, um, uh, backing from, say, a government or a nation state entity in order to achieve their intent. And then there must be some type of opportunity. So there must be an opportunity in your environment for that threat actor, for that malicious individual entity to achieve their hostile intent and leverage their capability. So when we think of opportunities, an opportunity inside of an organization could be an unpatched system, um, or it could be users who don't really uh, do a great job of filtering out potential phishing emails. They might just click on anything that comes into their email, or they might be socially engineered into uh, to providing their password. Um, so when we think of what a real cyber threat is to Lily, where I can focus my team's efforts and resources um, in order to proactively go after those threats, go after those things that we should care about, we think of a cyber threat as having those three overlaps. So they're the middle of those three, if it has a hostile intent to target the sectors in which my organization operates, they have a proven capability, meaning they've been successful in the past, or they have some knowledge, capability, or I mean, some type of resource, know-how, and we have some type of opportunity in our environment. Then those three components come together to to implement the per to establish the perfect storm and result in a cyber-based threat that your organization should care about. Um, and then when we look to think about how do we action at all all threats aren't the same or how do we potentially respond to them? all threats aren't the same so when we think of a threat to our organization um, there are commodity attacks so these are attacks or just uh, um, potential or unsophisticated attacks where i am using or i may have downloaded something off of the internet i'm a bad guy i may have downloaded something off the internet um, and I am trying to get you to click on it or trying to get you to go to a, a website um, that has some type of malware or hosted on it. Um, overall, we, continue, we, we more or less rely on our traditional AV solutions, um, our intrusion protection systems, and firewalls to try to mitigate these threats. Um, and, what, and, and we consider these kind of medium to low threats. Um, so these are where we operate in if you have um, signatures. So um, if this malware with, with this malware hash or a malware, if something operates in this specific mechanism, it, it changes some type of registry CMI environment, uh, prevent, it from a, from, prevent it from conducting or uh, being able to achieve that uh, deployment. So prevent that malware because we know that this specific malware functions in this way, it is named in this way, and it has these hashes prevented from being able to execute. 
So these, when we think of the Donald Rumsfeld quote, are where we see the known knowns. So we know that X malware exists in the, this malware potentially exists in, in the world. We know that they are deploying it um, via email. So when there are any emails that come in with the um, with attachments uh, named in this specific way, or have this hash, uh, or attempt to uh, execute, say, from an office document, prevent them from be, uh, being able to uh, execute and remove them from our environment. But then when we get into, say, the more sophisticated attacks, this is where we operate in the known unknowns. Um, maybe we know, again, that an adversary might want to target us, but we don't know how they're going to target us. Um, so we can't rely on our traditional commodity solutions, our AV, our intrusion protection systems, our firewalls. Um, so what we have to rely on in detecting some of this, so maybe we know a cyber criminal wants to gain access to our email, um, to potentially to send other malicious emails to other users in Lilly or at, at Purdue. Um, we, but we don't know exactly what malware that they will use. So this is where, the, again, we operate in the known unknowns of knowing someone wants to target us but not knowing how they might target us. So what we rely on in this space is more advanced technologies where it's maybe machine learning, AI, or detection of anomalous behaviors. So we know someone might want to target us via email. Uh, so I am going to focus monitoring of emails for anything which is irregular. So if, for instance, <clears throat> we, 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 we never receive emails um, from uh, this email address, and we found that um, based off of communication with some of our peers and some of the other information that we've collected, um, that emails from this uh, source are 80% malicious. So, again, I, what I would want to do in that case is alert on any emails or attempt to detect or prevent uh, emails from that source from being able to originate or, or to arrive to my organization or to my users. Um, we also have some very cool resources that allow us to do this from, say, a sandboxing standpoint. So when we think of sandboxing, if something comes in and I don't want my users to open it before I know that it's safe, um, I can allow this um, sandbox solution to open this um, email, open this document, or open the attachments on something which is segmented from my environment and then determine whether or not it is safe or not. So that's how we kind of try to work to detect or mitigate the threats or the risks um, that are associated with the known unknowns. Um, but then when we operate in the known unknowns, this is where we think of targeted attacks. Uh, so a targeted attack, it could be a threat, we that a, a threat actor is going to dedicate special resources, their personal time into conducting reconnaissance and understanding um, ways in which they can compromise our organization and then tailoring their approach um, in order to be successful in achieving their objective against us. So in this case, they may stand up a completely new new malware variant. So there, there's no way that we can rely on signatures to detect this uh, potentially malicious behavior. Um, and because maybe we don't know that they want to come in via email, there's no way that we can really, really rely on behavioral-based detection. So this is where uh, in this advanced detection is more um, operating in the AI space um, and the machine learning space. Um, so where it seeks, where technology seeks to establish a baseline, um, not not uh, technology computers uh, seek to uh, establish a baseline of normal behavior across organization and then alert on any deviations from that. 
So um, this, this goes beyond the behavioral-based detections that we can implement, uh, but then this goes into the space of technology actually looking at and establishing um, real-time analytics of our space and saying anything that falls outside of this gap, um, I am outside of this space, I'm an alert on. So for instance, a user logging on in Indianapolis and then five minutes later, a user logging in in Pakistan to that same account. Um, so while this is something extremely difficult from a manual or human uh, perspective to detect, machine learning and AI enables us to kind of detect these large anomalous and suspicious behaviors, which might be kind of overlooked um, in the terabytes and terabytes of data that my organization and, and lots of other organizations collect. Any questions before I move on? Um, so when we think about all of those threats that we're faced with, how do we de how do we detect? How do we prevent? How do we implement some type of control or mitigation? So this goes back to the art of war uh, quote that I, that I had up there um, at the beginning with my introduction. So first and foremost, know yourself, um, know your environment, know the bad guys, and um, know how they function. And then based off of those components, knowing who you, who you're, who you are, the sectors in which you operate, what are your most critical assets and data, and how the adversary may target you, what their motivation is, tailoring your detections in order to detect any artifacts or prevent any artifacts which are indicative of um, the adversary behaviors that you've identified. Um, and, and I'll have, a, at the very end of this, I'll kind of have a real quick, high, extremely high level, simplistic um, overview of this concept. Um, so when we first look to kind of understand ourselves, we kind of work first to use a model, or this is, there's various other models that you could potentially use, but this is just one, <clears throat> one of my favorites, a, mo a model called Carver. Um, so we want to look at our organization um, and you probably look across, you know, if you're in your, your rooms, if you're wherever you are and try and do this similar thing. Um, you want to understand what are your most critical possessions? Um, what are the things that you care about and allow you to function on a day-to-day -day basis? And then if you understand what those are, and understand, work to understand how accessible are they. So if some, anyone comes into your space, can they just pick it up? Or when, you're, when, when it's not in your view, it's locked down? Or from a computer stamp, from a network standpoint, um, if the only way that someone could potentially access it is if they come into, say, Purdue's a local network with one of their accounts, and then they can access that resource. Um, and then if you're looking at your assets, you work to understand how recoverable are they. So if this resource was lost, if this resource was broken, um, if someone compromised this resource or this asset that, that is extremely critical to you, um, how likely are you able to recover it? How quickly could you recover it? How, how impactful would the loss of this asset be to your daily operations, to your daily function? And then from a vulnerability standpoint, you, you, you identify whether or not it was accessible. Um, but for instance, is there any type of holes in the way in which you store this, um, this asset? Um, are you storing this asset via uh, near a window? Are you plugging this uh, asset into um, a 
internet um, to a to uh, to an internet network that you don't control. That anyone and and everyone who's walking past uh, your area can connect to it. Um, and then from a computer standpoint, if you think of um, everyone here and, and via their various technologies, receive multiple updates from a Windows standpoint, from a Mac standpoint. Um, are there vulnerabilities in the operating system or any hardware which could allow someone to gain unauthorized access or achieve their um, hostile intent against them? And then overall, what would be the effect? Um, so if you lost this most critical asset by which you've identified is vulnerable or is, most ac is accessible and is not quickly recoverable, um, are you now at this point not going to be able to achieve something in the short run or in the long term um, that is critical to your, your continued success? And then recognizability. So from a important standpoint, if I, being a potential malicious individual and entity, walk into your space or gain access to your space, well, I automatically know that this asset is the most critical thing that you potentially have. Um, how, how easily will it be for me to determine potential naming conventions for your asset? Um, so what we can do with this understanding is then grade the most, the, the, the criticality, the accessibility, the recoverability, the vulnerability impact, and recognizability of our most assets. And then what this allows us to do is prioritize our time, our resources, our efforts, and in, in order to ensure that we might not be able to protect <clears throat> or prevent all threats from being realized to all of our assets, um, but those ones that have the highest value, the highest impact on my operations, um, I'm most assuredly going to focus on making sure that whatever my controls are, whatever my mitigations are, um, I and whatever resources I have are going to be applied to making sure nothing happens to these. Um, and this is exactly how it works with an organization like Lilly. Um, we, again, we operate in multiple different countries, um, uh, thousands of users, thousands of customers, and thousands of relationships that we have to manage. Uh, we, even though we are a large corporation, cannot apply all of our, our resources to mitigate all of the threats that we could potentially be faced with. Um, but if I prioritize um, mitigating the risks and the threats specifically to the assets which are most critical, to my organization and that are potentially vulnerable um, or might be impact my overall organization, um, then I am taking a uh, organized strategic approach to mitigating the risk to my organization. Um, so when we think of threats, um, and these are just some definitions that uh, feed into um, so, my next. Corey, uh, Corey, excuse me, uh, it, it's Leonardo Santos. Uh, could you please just go back one slide? I have a question related to it. Absolutely. So um, here in this model, you're presenting like one, two, three, four, six uh, different approaches to evaluate a threat or to evaluate the capability, the entire capability for cybersecurity protection. But uh, I think feel like vulnerability sounds, at least for me, it sounds a little bit redundant if you combine them with accessibility and um, recuperability, because I feel that um, the more accessible you are, uh, the less you can recover, the more vulnerable you are. Why are you addressing vulnerability as a separate item if you can have the same results from a combination of accessibility and recuperability? So, a uh, really great question. Uh, when we think of vulnerability, and that's a, that, that isn't a good way to think of it, but when we think of vulnerability, we think about the vulnerabilities that are inherent in a piece of technology. Um, so, 
Um, there are various vulnerabilities that come across in the various servers, computers, endpoints um, that we leverage um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so Microsoft, every Tuesday of the month, publishes a large list of vulnerabilities that have come out from various entities um, you know, looking at and dissecting the technologies they built. Um, so these vulnerabilities could be things such as um, there is, if I send a specially crafted email to um, your email gateway, anyone that accesses that email, um, it's going to, that email is going to then give me special control over that system. So where, where we think in recuperability and recognizability, 100%, that, that could be a component of, in the long run, of vulnerability, and it is, it's areas in which we look to assess. Um, so if, for instance, from a recuper, uh, recognizability standpoint, um, we can have a highly critical vulnerability in a piece of technology that we leverage. But if it's behind multiple firewalls, it's not accessible um, via the Internet, then our priority or concern about someone being able to compromise that vulnerability probably diminishes. But overall, that does not diminish the fact that it has a, it has a flaw and its operating system or its hardware where if all of those gateways, all of those various different checks were removed, someone would be able to exploit it. Um, cause does that kind of make sense? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, got it. So basically we are saying when we're looking at vulnerability, um, I, I'm trying just to make a parallel with my world. Uh, it's basically uh, the things that I know about my components. My components. I mean, the weaknesses I know from my components that can be exploited and compromise my system entirely. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Got it. You, you built a special app that uses, say, Apache Struts. Apache Struts and this special app has to be internet facing for users to your customers to yeah. use it. Um, but you found out that Apache Struts, which is uh, a web uh, gate, which is a web platform, um, has a vulnerability where if I send this package to it, I can take control of the backend server and various other components that that Apache Struts is built on. So yes, mm -hmm. it's, it's understanding the larger what are what are the technologies that you're, you're leveraging. Okay, understood. Thank you. Um, so when we, these are common terms when we're looking at a threat. Um, so we have observables and indicators. Uh, so when we think of a adversary or criminal's infrastructure, they may use IP addresses or uh, specific domains. Um, where they uh, where they host their potential malware, or once they gain access to your environment, they may use these IP addresses, uh, potential Tor nodes, et cetera, in order to call um, allow that malware, which might have got, gained access to your environment, to call home to them. So when we think of observables and indicators, we think of the infrastructure. So IP addresses, domains. Um, maybe the hashes uh, of the malware that they leverage. Um, so we want to know from a threat standpoint, what, what is their infrastructure? What are the observables and indicators that I can quickly look in my environment to determine if there's some type of match? Um, so what this looks like is um, I know bad guy X uses um, – a specific IP address, I'm going to look through my proxy logs for this specific indicator or observable. Then we have TTPs. So these TTPs are tactics, techniques, and procedures. So this is once an adversary gains access to your environment, how do they operate? And in, in an upcoming slide, I'll kind of walk through some known ways that adversaries operate. 
Um, but okay, once they send, they they may send a phishing email to users, maybe in your finance department. Um, once they gain access to a user or a user clicks on that email, they may use a vulnerability in a system to elevate their privileges um, and then get to gain access to the data in which they need. And then they'll exfiltrate that data um, by sending it out via um, the access that they gave to your email. And then once they're done with all of that, they're going to clear the logs on the system. So everything that they've done is the TTPs that they use. Um, and what we traditionally found is once an adversary, once a bad guy um, has identified a successful set of TTPs that they've employed and they've had success with, they usually uh, try to stick um, to this. Um, and then an incident is exactly what it sounds like. So if a threat actor actually gains access to your environment, um, is successful in either achieving all of their TTPs or a, a portion of their TTPs, then this for an organization like Lilly becomes an incident. Um, and then an exploit target, uh, we can think of these as, some also call them as attack vectors. Um, if I look at your organization and I try to dissect what is the easiest way for me to get into your organization, Maybe it's by tricking a user to to go to a website. Um, maybe in the case of coronavirus, maybe I stand up a website which gives fake news um, about coronavirus, and anytime someone goes to it, I, I, I'm able to download malware onto their machine. Um, and then a campaign is um, TTPs and exploit targets used across a large group of organizations um, or environments. So one specific attack, okay, that's, that's an attack. But if I use this across multiple different environments, multiple different type of organizations, then what, that's what we consider a campaign. Um, then a threat actor, a threat actor can be a cyber criminal, a hacker, a hacktivist. Um, and next slide kind of goes a little bit further into this, the types of threat actors that we have. Uh, or we track. And then a course of action is, think of a course of action as how do we mitigate that TTP or campaign from being realized at our organization? What controls do we implement? Um, and I know this is a bit of an eye chart, but I, I, to, for me it has a lot of great information. Um, so when we think of the spectrum of cyber criminals, hacktivists, adversaries that would tar want to target my organization or your organization. Um, this is kind of the buckets in which they fall in. So at the bottom of the pyramid, starting off with script kitties. So these script kitties are individuals which might not have any true know-how. Um, they might download something or watch their YouTube video um, and they want to try it out. So uh, they downloaded um, a, a malware and they're going to send it to someone that they might have found just to see if they're going to be successful. Um, what they predict, whatever, what they are more, more often than not goal or their potential intent is, is trying to gain access to whatever they potentially can gain access to. Um, they more or less operate in the spectrum of um, bragging or wanting to just, you know, be known as someone who, who is a hacker uh, or potentially even some early financial gain efforts. Um, so for these script kitties, for these non-malicious tier one attackers, we more or less rely on our um, commodity detection. So we rely on our AV solutions, our intrusion protection systems, to track variants and the tools in which they leverage um, and uh, alert on or prevent execution of those things. So this, for anyone who's familiar, some popular uh, mechanisms, some popular um, exploit kits that are used, things like Metasploit, where it um, has you know some legitimate uses. It's also a good platform that hackers also leverage um, in order to either you know deploy malware gain access to your system. So this is where we more or less rely on our commodity detections in, in, in order to operate. 
then you move up the, the, the spectrum of this pyramid from to uh, tier two, tier three, uh, and tier three where, uh, I mean, tier four, where these are more crime-focused organizations or entities. Um, so it could be low-level um, at low-level cyber criminals um, who may have a little bit of know-how um, that are primarily focused on disruption, all the way up to cyber criminals who are focused on theft of IP or potential sale on either the dark web or even uh, tier four cyber criminals who can operate as cyber mercenaries. Uh, so a cyber mercenary can be someone who has a know-how and maybe I, as a malicious company, um, want know that Apple may be coming out with a, a brand new phone. Uh, so maybe I employ a cyber mercenary to gain, gain access to that technology ahead of time through cyber hacking um, by using special malware that they uh, created, um, backdoors, et cetera. Um, in order to gain access to that, in order to potentially reverse engineer it or repurpose or steal the technology. And then we have at the top tier of this pyramid, this is where we can operate in the nation state. So the, um, uh, the, the countries, the countries who um, have um, cyber capabilities and they potentially employ their cyber capabilities um, in order to achieve or align with strategic objectives um, of, the, of their country. So potentially maybe they want to steal national secret data or uh, information from the defense sector in order to elevate or advance their own country's um, national defense. Um, and then when we, get the, when we look at the organizations or entities that we care or potentially should care the most about, um, the top of the pyramid, of course, being the highest risk or concern to your organization. Um, because at the top of the pyramid, this is where threat actors or cyber criminals operate um, in more of the targeted attack space. Um, they have well, re they are resourced. They have funding from a country. Um, they have the ability to uh, take time and dissect technology and uh, identify various different ways in which to break into it. Um, so when we, and more or less when we think of how long these groups operate inside of our environment and how successful they are, more often than not those at the top of the pyramid are more successful in achieving their objectives uh, because they tailor their approach and technology has not been able to stay update, stay, Security technology is not able to quickly get as far ahead of them as they have been able, as they potentially may have been able to um, develop some type of vulnerability or zero day. Um, so, a model that we use in order to dissect the an adversary's intent and capability is a mechanism called MITRE. Um, MITRE breaks down based off of all of the known cyber attacks that have been experienced by organizations. Um, it break, seeks to break down how these how these entities operate, um, and then based off of how they operate, you can then use the, this to tailor your approach um, to uh, how do you detect, how do you mitigate. Um, so I don't know if you, I, I just brought up something different on my screen. I don't know if you guys can see it. Yeah, we, yeah, we can see it. Uh, so this is MITRE. MITRE is a mechanism, again, that breaks down how adversaries or criminals function and operate. Um, so what it does is I can go in here and I can add my own information to it and say, okay, well, the threat actors that I care about on that pyramid, uh, maybe I care about APT, so an APT is an advanced persistent threat or a cyber group. Uh, maybe I care about APT-17. And I then, based off of that, I can understand that APT functions by first uh, maybe fear phishing um, in order to gain initial access. Once they uh, spear fish you, maybe they use power shell. Um, to de deploy their malware, um, and then once 
they uh, gain access to their malware and they have persistence or appropriate privileges. Uh, maybe they deliver or delete um, the, ex the 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 delete the files or logs um, which were, were were indicative or of them being ac having access to your environment. So what we do is try to develop for all the groups or all of the adversaries that we care about, map out what are their patterns of behaviors. So we can think of these patterns of behaviors as tactics, techniques, and procedures. And again, once they once an adversary traditionally finds something that is successful with them, they usually either use that specific those specific TTPs again or some type of variation. Um, and and then what does that mean to uh, my organization, or what does that mean to my team? So at the very top here, my team collects information from all of our various different sources. So maybe we want to comb the dark web. Maybe we want to comb um, cyber criminal forums. Uh, maybe we want to use our reporting from vendors such as McAfee, Semantic, et cetera. Um, which kind of affect the malware that an adversary uses, um, what are their motivations, what vulnerabilities do they seek to exploit, uh, what, uh, what are, do they have some type of zero-day capability. We take all of that information and bubble it down into some things that are actionable, efforts that my organization can specifically take in order to mitigate the threats that we are faced with. And what this being goes back to is knowing yourself, know, knowing your environment, so knowing your assets, knowing the vulnerabilities that you have inherent inside of your environment, knowing those actors or knowing your adversaries who would like to target you, and then knowing their course of action, knowing their patterns of behavior. And then what you can then do with that knowledge is apply your controls and your mitigations to focus on any indication or artifacts indicative of those adversaries' behaviors um, executing or living with the side of your environment, which would then prevent them from gaining access, access to your most critical assets. I um, mean, since we only have a few more minutes, I'll just walk through a kind of a bridge overview um, of this whole, this whole concept. Uh, so this is a, an extremely high level and not detailed example of this, but I, I just thought it would be an interesting case study. So if we think of this concept of using information and data that we collect from our various different sources and we apply it to, say, Batman in the Batcave. Um, so if we think of Batman in the Batcave and we think of what is his most critical assets, um, I don't know if anyone wants to chime in and say and kind of think about what he what he or is most critical to his operations. Alfred. Yes, I was definitely thinking Alfred, and I have Alfred as well. So Alfred, <laughs> uh, maybe his email, uh, maybe his transportation mechanisms, um, um, maybe his com communication mechanisms. So if we think of his most critical assets um, that might not be quickly, uh, that are critical, um, which might not be extremely uh, recoverable, um, these are things in which he probably should focus on protecting amongst his, you know, amongst his most critical assets. Um, so if we're thinking about who he potentially might want to protect them against, who, who would be someone that might come up? Anybody? Maybe maybe we think about the Joker. Maybe we use the Joker as the adversary that is most critical and at the highest priority of uh, protecting his most critical assets again. Um, so we can then uh, dissect how does the Joker function? What is his motivation? Um, potential motivation probably being just extreme chaos um, and just being overall a bad person 
amongst Gotham and um, upsetting upsetting the Batman. And then if we think about how he functions or what is his tactics, techniques, and procedures, we've seen from some of his various other interactions that he's uh, somewhat physical. He has um, various different um, Joker or clown-based technology that he employs, um, and he has a certain level of intellect. Um, and then what sectors in which did he target? We think of, you know, Batman and Gotham City. And then how does he, you know, what is his motivation being sabotaged and destruction? And for some reason, what is his resources? For some reason, he's, well, not for some reason, he's insanely rich. He conducts a whole lot of crime, so he has the resources in order to achieve his objective. And he has a high-level capability um, to, to also uh, to ensure that his objective is successful, his operations are successful. So when we think of how do we apply controls to detect or prevent those, we can understand that maybe from a stand, from a threat standpoint, the Batman's most critical assets being Batcave, Alfred emails, and maybe it's communication. Um, his highest threat that he's potentially concerned about being the Joker. What are the controls that we're going to apply? Uh, focus on preventing the Joker from achieving access to his assets. So we're going to implement security systems. We're going to ensure that the location isn't easily recognizable, and we're going to implement some type of encryption. Um, that makes sense for me. And as we only have a few more minutes, I just want to leave a few minutes for questions. Hey, Corey, I had a question. Um, coming from a military mindset and background, what surprised you most about the corporate risk mitigation environment? Um, great question. So right now, unlike any time in history, uh, corporate entities are now being faced with cyber threats, cyber criminals, which traditionally only in the past would employ their resources to target you know, the, the, the defense sector. Um, but because these countries, nation states, have started, began to realize that, you know, they can advance not just their defense, but the, um, the strategic, other strategic sectors in, within their countries, such as healthcare, technology, et cetera, um, by just stealing some of the data that they have, ac that other, uh, that certain private companies have access to and that maybe security isn't as tight um, as some of their targets in the defense sector, that they are going to employ, employ their resources against um, these private corporations. Um, so what has surprised me is increasingly we have to try to think of ways in which to protect our data, our assets um, against some of these cyber threats um, where we don't have the same resources um, and information that is inherent and available um, to the government sector. So that's still something we're still trying to figure out. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, hi, Corey. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you have you experienced any sort of uh, um, like an attack or any sort of disturbance while monitoring the Eli Lilly's networks? Um, so, we're not being able to give any real actual specifics. Um, we, on a regular basis, um, experience some type of incident. It might not be an incident where Someone may may have been a adversarial criminal was successful, um, but maybe they were able to get malware into our environment. Um, so we are we are still functioning to make sure that we can prevent them from. Uh, we understand that a cyber criminal there are, there are thousands and thousands of cyber criminals, and they only have to be right once. Um, we have to be right all the time in order to prevent them from, from, from being successful in our environment. 
Um, so we know that it's not going to be a perfect game where we're going to say we're going to stop all cyber attacks from being realized, um, but we want to prevent the the higher level ones um, or anyone from being successful in um, impacting our most critical operations. Thank you. No more questions? My God, seems not. Seems not. Do we have more questions here? I can okay. ask another question. Um, how many targeted um, attacks does Lily see as opposed to just bots or autonomous attacks like how many like sophisticated target attacks do they see um so not being able to give specific numbers but it's a minute number compared to um the more bots and and uh commodity attacks um so i can say i say a minute number being say 10 and a, a 10 within a certain calendar uh, month or quarter where we might receive hundreds and hundreds of bots and various other um, broad phishing and various other types of attacks. Um, is there any one sort of attack which you'd consider more high risk or a most dangerous? So it varies depending on the time frame. So it, it, it's 100% focused on an adversary and what they're focusing their time and effort into um, tailoring and refining. What we're seeing more so now is ransomware. So um, and targeted ransomware at, at that amongst not 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 at Lily but across you know all verticals. Um, targeted ransomware being um, I have. I am a criminal entity, a criminal syndicate, cyber-based criminal syndicate. Um, I'm going to do research on your specific organization. Um, I am going to tailor my entrance and the attack vectors in order to compromise uh, your specific assets. So this maybe might be you have some vulnerable, uh, brute forceable um, RDP instances available to the internet. I'm going to gain access to those uh, exposed instances, and then I'm going to use that access to get, well, first to gain access to your environment, and then once I gain access to your environment, I'm going to work to elevate privileges to near admin or domain admin, and then I'm going to lock up your most critical assets and demand a ransomware based off of a ransom, um, based off of what I believe the most amount that I can get out of your organization based off the impact that I hear. Um, we are seeing a lot of our peers and other organizations um, that we interact with and knock on wood experiencing that type of attack on a daily and weekly basis. So right now that is kind of, I guess, the focus of this, a lot of cyber criminals. Thank you. That shows a lot about the current situation. Hi, Kari. Um, I wonder if you could comment on um, inside threat. Let's say, like, if you know, some insiders start to launch some attack. Like, um, could you comment on this case? Um, at, a, at a very high level, so insider threat also does fall un, under my team as well. Um, so, an insider threat for someone is not where there's a few different spectrum of insiders. Um, so there are insiders who just might be untrained um, and might conduct, uh, might do something which harms the organization or, or opens up some type of opportunity um, or compromise the organization. Um, this could be maybe they weren't paying attention and um, they sent um, personal, uh, personal PII, personal identifiable information. Um, to an email address that they shouldn't have been that they shouldn't have. 
So while this is a mistake, we still consider them a potential insider. Um, then there are some there are insiders who might potentially be um, dis disenfranchised, dissatisfied because maybe they were passed over for some sort of promotion which they believe that they should have got. Um, so maybe their aim in this case um, might not be um, you know theft of data, theft of data. Um, but as they leave the organization because they you know, found some new opportunity, maybe they implement some type of logic bomb or release some type of malware um, or take some data with them on their last day, um, which they plan to use at their next job. So this is also a, a type of insider. Um, and then we also, you can also have insiders who maybe, maybe they've been um, coerced or paid um, by a, a, a cyber criminal, an external cyber criminal, an external nation state, um, in order to steal data or pass along the research in which they they have access to. Um, so we have to think about, from my team, from my perspective, who are who, um, what would be the potential motivations of these cyber criminals? What would be the indicators that I mean, insiders will be potential indicators of. Um, a insider, and then how do we potentially detect it? Um, we also have to, you know, just because we want to secure our organization, we still have to do all of this protection while giving our employees you know, a certain level of privacy. Um, so we have to try to protect our data from malicious insiders while not also considering everyone to be an insider. That kind of answer your question. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, if not, um, let's thank our speaker again. Really appreciate it. And uh, stay safe, everyone. Great. Thanks a lot, Corey. Stay safe. Thank you so much, Corey. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right.